Colleagues and friends, I'm John Williams, the Acting Provost, and it gives me great, immense pleasure to welcome you all, those of us in person, and those joining on the live streaming to the University of Adelaide to celebrate Professor John Goodsey. In a year when we all wish we could hit the factory reset button, I'm so pleased that for the next hour or so, we can be taken away from the pandemic. During our time together, we will take a moment to concentrate on excellence, on creativity, on the importance of community, and engage with the ideas and the senses which frame our humanity. I first met John in October 2001 on the steps of Lower Campus at the University of Cape Town. I was enjoying a sabbatical at the Law School in the shadow of Table Mountain. The introduction to John was brief, fortuitous, and one for which I will be forever grateful. John was transitioning to Adelaide and we agreed to catch up when he and Dorothy arrived in South Australia. We did. I recall it was in that most Adelaide of settings, the Adelaide Central Markets. It is not for me to reflect upon the significance of John's work and its impact it has had on the intellectual landscape. The world has responded to that already and has made honours and awards from the most prestigious institutions. For me, John's work unsettles many of the comfortable perceptions of law and history that operate within my own discipline. By asking enduring questions about certainty and truth, he places in sharp relief a number of often ill-theorised responses or glib answers. One of the perennial discussions in popular and academic circles is the existence of what may be described as South Australian exceptionalism. To what extent, if at all, is our community a repository of difference or insights that can be contrasted from the rest of the country? Historical examples, such as votes for women or a progressive attitude towards social experimentation are usually highlighted in order to make the case for its existence and celebration. If there is an example in modern times of this exceptionalism, it is the embrace of intellectuals such as John, of a city, of a place which seeks to grapple with matters of importance. We truly live in a city of human scale that is often unafraid to consider through the arts and the social sciences, the human condition. I like to think that the university plays a role in that discussion. We are the benefactors of John and Dorothy's decision to join our community and I, like many others, are extremely grateful. We are a better place for your presence. On a personal note, your move to Adelaide was a precondition for a cherished friendship. The campus of the university is at its most beautiful at this time of year. As a reminder of our history, the university has installed banners across the campus to acknowledge its many thinkers, its scholars, its leaders throughout the decades. John is rightly so acknowledged. It gives me great pleasure to see John on campus, walking to the library or to his office from time to time. It reminds me of an introduction 20 years ago that was brief, fortuitous, and has proved to be so delightful. Thank you, John and Dorothy. Colleagues, I would now like to welcome our Master of Ceremonies, Professor Nick Jose. Thank you, John, and good morning, everyone, on this happy day. There are a few housekeeping matters um, for those who are here physically. Um, please ensure your mobile phones are turned to silent. Bathrooms are located in the foyer. Should we need to evacuate, please follow the directions of the staff and as you are doing, please maintain social distancing protocols. We start by acknowledging the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains on whose land we meet. 
and we pay our respects to their elders, past, present and future, and to other Indigenous people present here today. And in particular, Kira Bain, Narinjeri woman, who I now invite to perform an acknowledgement of country. Thank you, Kira. Mani na pudni, nyanke na mia na mani. Ngana ri kiritu yalto wario na kamara baini, ya ti tendro lo ngar lo kani ya tanga pan pa pan pa ya rente. Mani ngar lo tampente ngar lo kani ya tanga imprente. Ngar lo tampente porke na buki nangku yalaka tarkareta. Na chali nengku tendro weta nakara. Does anyone know what I said? I said, welcome everyone. How are you all? I actually asked if um if you're all fat because traditionally if you're fat, you're good, you eat. Um, that's not seen like that today, but that's traditionally what it was. We never asked how you were, so we ask, are you all fat? Um, my name is Kira Bain. Um, I have a few language names. Yaldo Wario Nakamara. Yaldo means the pelican. Um, that's my totem. Wario means I'm the second born female in my family. Traditionally, you talk to the oldest person in the family, so that's why I do this, because no one wants to talk to me. Um, and the last one is Nakamara, that's a skin name. You get that when you're married up. If you're, if you're with someone for more than like three days, you're married. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge this land that we're meeting on today is the traditional lands for the Ghana people. I'd like us to recognise and respect their language, traditions and beliefs. Um, I also want to pay respects to elders past, present and future. Also, um, people like myself, coming from other, other countries. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Kira. Well, earlier this year, on the 9th of February, John Curtsy turned 80. There was a big celebration at the Amazwi South African Museum of Literature in Makanda, in South Africa, Makanda, formerly Grahamstown, to mark that occasion. And we hope to reciprocate here, but of course our plans were thwarted by the pandemic of this year. But now, happily, within that birthday year, we are able to celebrate. And I'd like to thank you all for joining us this morning and also welcome those of you watching online. We've been able to share something of the celebration at Amazwi through the images and sounds on screen. Images from scenes from the south, the exhibition at Amazwi co-curated by Kai Easton, together with footage from her film with Rick Barney, Roads of France, that we've seen um, at the beginning of this program as we've been coming in. And at the end, we will see and hear music from the Makanda Kwantu Choir and Eva Collective from Amazwi, filmed by Francois Verster. So please sit at the end um, and enjoy that too. J.M. Kurtzi is among the most widely read and respected writers in the world and his influence goes far and wide. His life as a writer is indicated in that long list of books in the back of your programs. Today we'll begin by hearing readings and performances that respond to his work in different ways and then we will hear from the man himself. Some of us here have contributed to a collection called A Book of Friends, edited by Dorothy Driver, John's life partner, for this 80th birthday occasion. It's published by text and it's available from imprints booksellers um, in the foyer along with John's books 
and there'll be a signing afterwards. But we begin with the South African composer Peter Klatso, a lifelong friend of John's, who's written a birthday tribute for string quartet. It's called 80 Notes, and that's how long it is. We'll hear it performed in a moment in this world premiere by Cameron Hill and Francesca Hugh on violin, Aidan Sullivan on viola, and David Moran on cello. It's so short, in fact, that we thought you'd like to hear it more than once. So it will be played as an interlude between some of the readings we're going to hear as we go along. And by the end, you may like to hum along with it. Um, after 80 notes, we'll go straight on to our first two readings by Shannon Burns and Mick Samuelson. My name is Shannon Burns. I'm reading from my contribution uh, to a book of friends. Um, this piece is a kind of collage of quotations from Kutzi's autobiographical novel, Scenes from Provincial Life, and the title is also taken from those novels. Where's John? Was he already dead? Will he ever wake up? Was he not made to love women? Where will he find the time? Why do they not come together in a feast of sexual delight? Why does a bouncing ball eventually stop bouncing? If one is finicky about sex, is one rejecting life? Why would they behave so cruelly? Why can he, can he not have a normal relationship with his mother? Is he sorry? What does she mean? What if his father is right? What is truth anyway? Can one make art out of sickness? What is the key to equanimity? What happens afterwards between a man and a woman who have failed at the game? Why should they care? What if he stay, stays and fails disgracefully? Do inner qualities count for nothing? How is she to save him? Why do they not hear the last bleatings of the victim behind the shed, smell its blood, and take heed? Who is the greatest writer in the world? What is it that makes them forbear? From what are you fleeing? When are you going to die? How does it work, the cleansing action that misery is reputed to have? What is it that keeps him in existence? Who is to say that at each moment while the pen moves, he is truly himself? Is it possible to be dull and ordinary, not only on the surface, but to one's deepest depths, and yet be an artist? Does he want to be made unhappy? Why? If he is a mystery to himself, how can he be anything but a mystery to others? Is that what growing up amounts to? Growing out of passion, of all intensities of soul? Why don't they do something about it? Is the self he sees at such moments merely what he appears to be, or is it what he really is? Whose fault is it? Where will he find what he needs to know? What is the point of anything? Can't he just be normal? Is this what passion does to a man? What does he know of sex? But is it true? What is the right answer? Why the dressing up, the ritual motions? How long does one mourn if one mourns? What is the upshot of this lack of heart? Is he going to persist in not playing the game, 
Will he have to swim beyond mere misery into melancholia and madness? Why the huge sham? If he were no longer himself, what point would there be in living? What do the words mean? Was it a huge mistake? Should he soldier on until closing time, though he is racked with yawns? What is the point of that? What was he expecting? What could be more human than sex? Is there something about the whole business that he has failed to understand? What sort of teacher will he make? What if, alone in his room, he begins to cry and cannot cease? Is this love? Should he call an ambulance? Who is to say that the feelings he writes in his diary are true feelings? Why was he leaning out of a window watching an empty street? What will he say? Why does he persist in making marks on paper? Will there be a reward for us one day? Why does he make the most ordinary things so hard for himself? And what of himself? Is he able to do what is required of him? What must he do? What is desire for? What does Jesus mean? Will everyone perish? Must it all be so cruel? Shall I let go? But how? Good morning, I'm Meg Samuelson and I'll be reading an extract from the ending of Life and Times of Michael Kern. It's a novel that returns me to a primal scene. A 15-year-old girl picks up an already well-thumbed book, this very one, that has found its way into the farmhouse in which she lives, restless and miserable. It is late in the last year of the last state of emergency before democracy came into being. But she doesn't know that yet. She feels endlessly trapped in a hateful state. And then she starts to read. She finds an unexpected tenderness, a generosity even, in the bone spare prose. She reads stupidly, looking for ways to endure the nightmare into which she's been born. Though it offers no practical advice, she understands that this is one of the stories that must guide her, that this is the book from which she must learn how to live. Soon after, everything starts to change at a dizzying pace. There's suddenly an abundance of optimism, and she too changes. Among other things, she learns to read more cleverly in this heady new state. But the optimism was, of course, untimely and misplaced. The emergency did not end. Instead, it became global and planetary. Now, now I return to this book as stupidly as before, seeking and finding in it sustaining intimations of how one might live. I was mute and stupid in the beginning. I will be mute and stupid at the end. There's nothing to be ashamed of in being simple. They were locking up simpletons before they locked up anyone else. Now they have camps for children whose parents ran away. Camps for people who kick and foam at the mouth. Camps for people with big heads and people with little heads. Camps for people with no visible means of support. Camps for people chased off the land. Camps for people they find living in stormwater drains. Camps for street girls. Camps for people who can't add two and two. Camps for people who forget their papers at home. Camps for people who live in the mountains and blow up bridges in the night. Perhaps the truth is that it is enough to be out of the camps, out of all the camps at the same time. Perhaps that is enough of an achievement for the time being. How many people are there left who are neither locked up nor standing guard at the gate? I have escaped the camps. Perhaps if I lie low, I will escape the charity too. The mistake I made, he thought, going back in time, 
was not to have had plenty of seeds, a different packet of seeds for each pocket. Seeds in my shoes too, and in the lining of my coat, in case of robbers along the way. He thought of the farm, the grey thorn bushes, the rocky soil, the ring of hills, the mountains purple and pink in the distance, the great still blue empty sky, the earth grey and brown beneath the sun, save here and there, where if you looked carefully, you suddenly saw a tip of vivid green, pumpkin leaf or, cab or carrot brush. It did not seem impossible that whoever it was who disregarded the curfew and came when it suited him to sleep in the smelly corner might be tired of life at the seaside and want to take a holiday in the country if he could find a guide who knew the roads. They could share a bed tonight, it had been done before. In the morning, at first light, they could go out searching the back streets for an abandoned barrow. And if they were lucky, the two of them could be spinning along the high road by 10 o'clock, remembering to stop on the way to buy seeds and one or two other things. And if the old man climbed up the cart and stretched himself, things were gathering pace now, and looked at where the pump had been that the soldiers had blown up so that nothing should be left standing, and complained, saying, what are we going to do about water? He, Michael Kay, would produce a teaspoon from his pocket, a teaspoon and a long roll of string. He would clear the rubble from the mouth of the shaft. He would bend the handle of the teaspoon in a loop and tie the string to it. He would lower it down the shaft deep into the earth, and when he brought it up, there would be water in the bowl of the spoon. And in that way, he would say, one can live. Thank you, for John, for the gifts that you shared so very generously with us. Thank you, Meg. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you, String Quartet. Um, and I should add that there's information about all of the participants in today's, um, today's celebration in your programs. Um, it's now my great pleasure to welcome pianist Anna Goldsworthy, who will play the Prelude and Fugue number three from the Well-Tempered Clavier, book one by J.S. Bach.
And I believe that's a piece of music of particular significance um, to John. Thank you, Anna. I'd now like to introduce our next three readers. We'll shortly hear from Sisonke Simang, who is joining us uh, online from Perth, and she will be followed by Anthony Yulman. But first, it's my delight to introduce Peter Goldsworthy, <laughs> um, a relation. <laughs> <laughs> It's an honour. Actually, I think I prefer my uh, interpretation of C sharp major. So, <laughs> actually, I think the C major prelude is about the limit these days. It is probably for most of us who play the piano. Um, look, I meet John on the for lunch on the first Tuesday of every month with uh, two other friends. We have a pretty good time. Um, solving some of those great issues that John was referring to, but also talking cricket and rugby. Uh, I talk far too much, and uh, Michael Morley is highly excitable. <laughs> but a few months ago, John told us a story that galvanised the conversation from start to finish. He arrived particularly animated. He'd been listening to Philip Adams' little wireless program, Late Night Live, the night before, he told us, when he was surprised to hear Philip announce, with deep regret, the sad news that the death of the Nobel laureate, J.M. Kurtzay. I imagine John tossed and turned all night. <laughs> Thrilled, itching to wake Dorothy and share his excitement, which he eventually did. She didn't seem surprised at the news of his death at all. <laughs> Are you sure, John? You don't sleep well. You must have dreamt it. Well, you don't want to die wondering. So they sat down and listened to the podcast of Late Night Live together and sure enough, there was no mention of the death at all. He had been resurrected overnight. <laughs> Vindication for Dorothy. My case rests, she said. You were hallucinating. Had you taken something? Have you been drinking again? <laughs> Actually, I made that bit up. <laughs> I can only imagine when, what went through Dorothy's mind too. Maybe John's losing his. John may have started doubting himself. Was he hallucinating? Was his teeming unconscious to blame? What would Freud say? Todestrieb, the famous, if slightly mistranslated, concept of the death wish. It was surely a relief to both of them when the true story emerged. Late Night Live had soon discovered their mistake and John's death had been edited from the podcast <laughs> and from the afternoon repeat. Over lunch, I asked John if he'd been flooded with concerned emails or calls after the first broadcast. And he said, a little wistfully, only two. <laughs> I was thinking that was a bit sad. But then I thought, what kind of idiot would email a dead bloke? <laughs> I asked Dorothy if she received any. One or two, she said, a little wistfully. Anyway, we had a fun lunch with even more laughs than usual. Morley beat me by a whisker to the predictable Mark Twain quote. The news of my death has been greatly exaggerated. I did remember something another deceased literary friend <coughs> of mine, Anton Chekhov, once mentioned to me in personal correspondence, <laughs> disguised as a story, the man in the case. People, he wrote, look happier in their coffins. <laughs> Happiest, I correct myself. I should explain I regard all of Chekhov's stories as personal correspondence addressed to me, posthumously. I'm a bit possessive, even jealous, of what I regard as a one-way friendship although to Anton it might look more like stalking. I certainly don't like our personal correspondence having other readers and can't get enough of sifting through his numerous, numerous biographies. I'd sift through his garbage if I could. I think many of us have a pathology jealous one-way pen friendships of, of that kind with the deceased writers who possess us in return from time to time, which brings me back to my and our relationship with the ambiguously deceased J.M. Kurtzay. 
Those of you who have been stalking John through his works will remember Summertime, the last in his scenes from Provincial Life, published in 2009. And you'll know he's already been dead for some years before that. The book includes selections from his journals published posthumously. The date isn't specified, or the cause of death, but it was apparently by his own hand, if only in a complicated literary sense. The book also contains recollections by several women of their late former friend or lover. They are all fascinating women who lead more interesting lives than he apparently did, which seems to be one of the points of the book, challenging our obsessive fascination with the lives of writers. I'm ignoring that today and sticking to my little kiss and tell. I hope that Lazarus has another seven lives in him. But I think the take home from that memorable lunch so far, and I'm trying to get it into a slightly more memorable form, is Joam Kurtse was never so animated, so alive, as the morning after the news of his death was announced. <laughs> P.S. Philip Adams emailed me yesterday to wish you, from one octogenarian to another, happy birthday. He's glad you made it through that difficult period. My name is Sasanke M. Simang, and like the subject of our discussions today, I am a South African writer who has made Australia home. So I'm going to read from the foreword of Waiting for the Barbarians. I was lucky enough to write that foreword in a new edition that was published by Text Publishing last year. Um, and it says much of what I want to say about J.M. Kutsir, about um, his writing and about how he has helped me to think about the role of a writer. So, here goes. I was six when Waiting for the Barbarians was published in 1980. I was a South African child born in exile, living on the edge of the empire J.M. Kutsir describes in his novel. I lived in Lusaka, an African city that was once answering to London. My father was part of a terrorist group, and so he was a barbarian, like those who populate the pages of Kutsir's book. My father did not ride a horse, as the barbarians in this novel do, but he was wild and dark and armed. This made me, the first of his daughters, a barbarian child. When I was a teenager and able to make my own choices about books, I filled my shelves with stories by and about the sort of barbarians who best represented me, Africans and their descendants. I read Chinua Achebe and Ngugi Wa Biongo and Aikwe Arma. I devoured The Bluest Eye and Tar Baby, which were difficult to read because Toni Morrison has never sought to offer her readers ease. And I ate up Mariama Ba and Buchi Amacheta. What these books had in common was their portrayal of black people as complex and heroic and flawed, but always as fully human. It was only in my mid-twenties when I was attending the University of Cape Town as a graduate student in politics that I fully encountered Kutsir. It was immediately apparent that he was not interested in telling heroic and humanizing stories about anyone, black or white. His books seemed to have little in common with the others that I loved. And when I began to read them, The Life and Times of Michael Kay first, and then Waiting for the Barbarians, I found them unsettling. Kutsir's tales were bleak and full of ambivalence and uncertainty. I found no solace in his characters and in the moral universes they inhabited. My instinct was to set his novels aside. South Africa was a free country and we were basking in the glow of President Mandela's leadership. I did not want to feel unsettled. I wanted to feel secure. 
I wanted to ignore the strangeness of Quitzio's writing and instead focus on the new times, on the good times. And so I finished the life and times of Michael Kay and put waiting for the barbarians aside, telling myself I would resume when I was ready. A few years later, protests emerged in opposition to Disgrace, which was published in 1999. The ruling party did not like Kutzier's books either. I picked up Waiting for the Barbarians again, curious to see if I was ready for him. Indeed, I was. While it is tempting to draw comparisons to Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness in many ways, Waiting for the Barbarians seeks to undo Conrad's damage. As Chinua Achebe observed 30 years ago, Heart of Darkness is a story in which the very humanity of black people is called in question. Waiting for the Barbarians, on the other hand, raises fundamental questions about the humanity of white people. It offers a frightening investigation into the pathos at the heart of whiteness, centering whiteness without sentimentalizing Europe. Having struggled with Kutsir, once I had claimed him, I found it impossible to let him go. Kutsir is an African writer, and this identity is not incidental to his writing. One cannot fully comprehend the layers of Kutsir's work without acknowledging the cultural and social legacy he inherits from the continent of his birth. Whether or not he wants us to claim him, he is ours. The broken politics of apartheid are deeply inscribed into Waiting for the Barbarians, and so it is right that Kutsir is read as a product of African history, as part of a rich African intellectual tradition. Turning to today, of course, men representing empire, like the main character in Waiting to, for the Barbarians, continue to marshal unspeakable violence against those characterized as barbarians. In recent times, as women's anger has peaked around the world and as powerful men everywhere have been put on notice for their sexual predations as part of the Me Too movement, the story of the magistrate and the barbarian girl has become relevant in new ways. I have thought about the magistrate's unwanted attention and his overwhelming power over a girl who simply wants to be left alone, and I have thought time and again about her indomitability and her refusal to submit to him. I have wondered, then, whether all along the barbarian girl Kutsia writes about wasn't the hero that I was always looking for in his novels. After all these years, this white tribesman who stands at the center of this weighty novel is still alive. More importantly, the barbarian girl is alive too. And she is free of her odd captor's attentions. If there is any comfort to be found in Waiting to the Barbarians, and indeed in Kutsir's writings, it is this. At root, Kutsir is always deeply committed to freedom in its most robust sense. Ease you won't find in his writing, but certainly a commitment to freedom and to doing the hard work of thinking about what freedom means at many levels. This is the legacy of J.M. Kutsir. Have a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful happy birthday. This is Anthony Ullman. I'm from West Sydney University, and I'll be reading from uh, a book which I wrote on uh, Kurtzay's fiction, published earlier this year by Bloomsbury Academic, called J.M. Kurtzay, Truth, Meaning, Fiction. Provocation is not merely a loose description of a feature of Kurtzay's works, but rather a characterization of their method or approach. Kurtzay underlines the importance of the provocation as, a, as the point from which his works of fiction start and the point towards which they tend. The provocation makes you think by either questioning the value of an assumed truth or facts, 
or requiring the creation of new truths adequate to the provocation. In this book, I consider a number of provocations, but all of them ultimately are drawn back into relation with three key ideas, three key provocations. Firstly, that there is truth in fiction, or that fiction can provide valuable understandings of real world problems. Secondly, that there are fictions of the truth, that we are surrounded in our everyday lives with stories we tell ourselves which we wish to believe are true. These two things are by no means identical. They are, nonetheless, inter-involved and confused. Thirdly, that meaning is created and processes and methods of writing can be developed to create a feeling of meaningfulness in texts and that this feeling, in turn, provokes readers to interpretation. Truth in fiction. Kurtz underlines the first provocation that fiction can offer us access to the truth in a number of places. This statement is provocative because in data-obsessed capitalist societies, it has become increasingly unpopular to make large claims for the importance of fiction or the arts. It is further provocative because it somehow calls upon the works to justify this claim and critics of those works to understand it. One of the places Kurtz sets out this point is in the first interview with David Atwell in doubling the point. Uh, quoting from Kurtze. We should distinguish two kinds of truth. The first, truth to fact, the second, something beyond that, and that in the present context we should take truth to fact for granted and concentrate on the more vexing question of a higher truth. As you write, you have to feel whether you are getting closer to it or not. Writing reveals to you what you wanted to say in the first place. Writing then involves an interplay between the push into the future that takes you to the blank page and a resistance. Out of that interplay there emerges, if you are lucky, what you recognize or hope to recognize as the true." End quote. This takes us back to ancient debates, beginning with Plato and Aristotle, which concern the very foundations of knowledge, that which allows us to recognize or understand some truth. Fictions of the truth. The second provocation seemingly inverts the first. If there is truth in fiction, there are also fictions of the truth. If truth in fiction relates to content, that is, insights or understandings that are not dependent on fictional expression, since the higher truths exist as intuitively grasped content that pre-exists that expression. Fictions of the truth relate to form, that is, they involve relation itself or storytelling, with stories understood to have profound effects on how we behave and live. These stories are not necessarily true and not necessarily ethical, but the implications is that they can create truths and thereby inform or deform ethical understandings. The further implication is that in this capacity, stories are the ubiquitous and principal way in which we understand or misunderstand. For better or worse, we surround ourselves with and understand ourselves through stories. Again, there's a classical precursor to this idea. Socrates excoriates bad rhetoricians in Plato's dialogues, Gorgias and the Sophists as those who convince through passing off stories as true that may not be true. As Nietzsche has shown, however, there is no escaping from rhetoric. One has to simply assume that there are bad rhetoricians, like Gorgias, and good rhetoricians, like Socrates. The idea that forms of expression might be either good or bad, depending on how they are used, is also at the heart of Foucault's examination of discursive formations, which both enable and limit what we can say. For Kurtz, the idea that the story is central to our sense of understanding has become so widely accepted as to be a cliche. Our culture uses the story as a default position for explaining our personal, interpersonal, social, economic, political, and ecological relationships. To put this another way, for Kurtz, with regard to the fictions of the truth, there are good stories and bad stories. To be a good story, uh, to be good, a story must be well told attending rigorously to the processes in which we're embedded, choosing the best methods to generate effects and stimulate affects in readers, and true, adequately expressing the insights which have driven the process of expression. The truth is created through method. The third provocation relates to the need to find a means of expression that might allow one to convey the truth, even though that truth might be obscured by the modes of thought that form us. Kurtzay resists the idea that we are completely constrained by forms of thought. In this study, I will sometimes call these forms methods as disciplines such as history, politics, philosophy, the sciences, and so on, 
are in part determined by the methods they're constrained to follow. I will argue that if it's possible to get outside our representations or develop representations that somehow allow us access to the higher truth, there must be a concept which is adequate to this idea. This concept is intuition. Uh, thank you and uh, thank you, John. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Pimang. And special thank you, String Quartet. That has been absolutely wonderful, and we've been able to hear the variations <laughs> in the time. John Kurtzi's achievement as a writer is often, often summed up by saying that he won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 2003. But that's only half of it. If you look at the list of books in your program, you'll see how many of them have appeared since 2003. And since the move to Australia, to Adelaide, novels, essays, autobiography, collaborations, published in many different places in different languages. That extraordinary continuing creative exploration here is a shining example for us all. But not all his many contributions to this university and to the community more widely are as visible as that. He's the patron of Voiceless, for example, an organization for animal protection and law. He's lent his name to the J.M. Kurtzi Center for Creative Practice at this university, which hosted a major international colloquium on his work in 2014. He writes regularly for the New York Review of Books, including a strong piece last year on Australia's refugee policies. He shares his ideas, his experience, his networks, his research interests. People come here because he is here, and it goes on across the generations from teacher to student. He travels widely, at least until 2020, um, in demand around the world as an advisor, curator, jurist, and participant in scholarly fora. One example is the Literature of the South seminars run by the Curtsy Chair at the National University of St. Martin in Buenos Aires which I was fortunate enough to attend in 2015. It's brought together writers across the southern latitudes from South America, Southern Africa, New Zealand, and Australia in scholarly and creative exchange. John is probably the most widely researched and cited living author and his work is continually being adapted into film and opera and other forms. So in short, uh, his inspiration is great. And your presence, John, among us is a gift. In a way, it's our birthday as well as yours. And with that, um, please, now it's your turn to take the stage.
Before I begin, uh, I wish to use this occasion to express a number of deeply felt thanks. First to the University of Adelaide, which for the past 18 years has provided me <coughs> with an academic base and allowed me to get on with my work. Then to the city of Adelaide for offering Dorothy and myself such a pleasant and easy home. Then to our neighbors in Spring Gully Road, who at a time when our elected representatives were, have so conspicuously defaulted, have demonstrated to the fullest the admirable Australian ethos of welcoming the stranger. To the Kana people, past and present, but particularly past, on whose lands we have made our home and whose benign tutelary presence I am continually aware of. A second round of thanks to those of you who behind the scenes have made this event a reality. Uh, John Williams, Nicholas Jos, whose birthday it is today, <laughs> uh, many happy returns, Nick. To uh, Pamela Thompson, Sarah Matthews, Tanya Johnson, and Ross Gamp. And to the musicians who have made this occasion so much sweeter, Anna Goldsworthy and the uh, Elder Conservatory Quartet. And in absentia to Peter Klatso, composer of the 80 notes, to the Quantu Choir, whom you'll be hearing, and to Francois Fester, Kai Easton, and Rick Barney, film recordists. And most of all to Dorothy Driver, the energizing spirit behind the event today. Finally, thanks to all of you who have taken time off from your busy schedules to be here. I have been hunting around in my oeuvre for a description of what it is like to be 80, but the best I can find is a description of what it was like to be 45, and that was bad enough. So instead, I'm going to read a couple of diary entries from a novel of mine called Diary of a Bad Year, published 13 years ago. The diarist in this novel writes as follows on the avian influenza virus H5N1 that swept across the world in 2006. 2007. It would appear that certain viruses, most notably the virus that causes avian influenza, are able to migrate from the species that normally host them to human beings. The 1918 influenza pandemic would seem to have been the work of an avian virus. If we can speak meaningfully of viruses as possessing or being possessed by a drive or instinct, it is an instinct to replicate and multiply. As they multiply, they take over more and more host organisms. It can hardly be their intention, so to speak, to kill their hosts, what they would like rather, is an ever-expanding population of hosts. Ultimately, what a virus wants is to take over the world. That is to say, to take up residence in every warm-blooded bloodstream. The death of any individual host is therefore a form of collateral damage, a mistake or miscalculation. The method used by the virus to cross from one species to another, the method of random mutation, 
try everything, see what works, cannot be said to be arrived at by rational planning. The individual virus does not have a brain and therefore a fortiori does not have a mind. But if we want to be resolutely materialist, we can say that the thinking, the rational thinking employed by human beings as they try to find ways of annihilating the virus or denying it a home in the human population is also a process of trying out biochemical neurological options under the command of some master neurological program called the reasoning process and seeing which one works. To a radical materialist, the broad picture is thus of two forms of life, each thinking about the other in its own way. Human beings thinking about viral threats in a human way, and viruses thinking about prospective hosts in a viral way. Pro the protagonists are involved in a strategic game, a game resembling chess, in the sense that the one side attacks, creating pressure aimed at a breakthrough, while the other defends and searches for weak points at which to counterattack. What is disturbing about the metaphor of relations between human beings and viruses as a chess game is that the virus always plays white and we human beings always black. The virus makes its move and we react. Two parties who embark on a game of chess implicitly agree to play by the rules. But in the game we play against the viruses, there is no such founding convention. It is not inconceivable that one day a virus will make the equivalent of a conceptual leap. And instead of playing the game, we'll begin to play the game of game playing. That is to say, we'll begin to reform the rules to suit its own desire. For instance, it may choose to discard the rule that a player shall make only one move at a time. How might this look in practice? Instead of striving, as in the past, to evolve a single strain capable of overwhelming the host body's resistances, the virus may succeed in evolving a whole class of dissimilar strains simultaneously, analogous to making a number of chess moves at once, all over the board. We assume that as long as it is applied with enough tenacity, human reason must triumph, is fated to triumph over other forms of purposive activity because human reason is the only form of reason there is, the only key that can unlock the codes by which the universe works. Human reason, we say, is universal reason. But what if there is, are equally powerful modes of thinking, that is, equally effective biochemical processes for getting to where your drives or desires incline you? What if the contest to see on whose terms warm-blooded life will continue on this planet does not prove human reason to be the winner? The recent successes of human reason in its long contest with virus thinking should not delude us, for they have occupied a mere instant in evolutionary time. What if the tide turns? And what if the lesson contained in that turn of the tide is that human reason has met its match? The other diary 
entry that I will read to you this morning is on boredom. Only the higher animals are capable of being bored, said Nietzsche. This observation must, I suppose, be taken as a compliment to man as one of the higher animals, though a compliment of a backhanded nature. Man's mind is restless. Unless it is given occupation, it'll become clouded with irritation, will descend into fidgetiness, and even eventually into malicious, ill-judged destructiveness. As a child, I would seem to have been an unwitting Nietzschean. I was convinced that the boredom endemic among my contemporaries was a sign of their higher nature, that it expressed a tacit judgment on whatever it was that bored them, and therefore that whatever bored them should be looked down on for failing to meet their legitimate human needs. So when my school fellows were bored by poetry, for instance, I concluded that poetry itself was at fault, that my own absorption in poetry was deviant, culpable, and above all, immature. In reasoning thus, I was abetted by much of the literary criticism of the day, which said that the modern age, meaning the 20th century, demanded poetry of a new, modern caste that would break decisively with the past, in particular with the poetry of the Victorians. To the truly modern poet, nothing could be more retrograde and therefore more contemptible than the liking for Tennyson. The fact that my classmates were bored by Tennyson proved to me, if proof was needed, that they were the authentic, if unconscious, bearers of the new modern sensibility. Through them, the zeitgeist pronounced its stern judgment on the Victorian age, and on Tennyson in particular. As for the troublesome fact that my classmates were equally bored to say nothing of being baffled by T.S. Eliot, this was to be explained by a lingering effeteness in Eliot, a failure on his part to measure up to their brusque masculine standards. It did not occur to me that my classmates found poetry boring as they found all their school subjects boring because they could not concentrate. The most serious consequence of the non sequitur into which I'd fallen, the highest intelligences are the soonest bored, therefore the soonest bored possess the highest intelligence, came in the area of religion. I found religion, religious observances boring. Therefore, a fortiori, my contemporaries as modern spirits had to find religion boring too. Their failure to betray symptoms of boredom, their willingness to parrot Christian doctrine and profess a Christian morality, while continuing to behave like savages, I took as evidence of a mature ability on their part to live out the disjunction between the real, visible, tangible world and the fictions of religion. Only now, late in life, do I begin to see how ordinary people, Nietzsche's bored higher animals, really cope with their environment. They cope not by becoming irritated, but by lowering their expectations. They cope by learning to sit through things, by letting the mental machinery run at a slower rate. They slumber, and because they do not mind slumbering, they do not mind being bored. To me, 
the failure of my teachers, the Maris brothers, to appear each morning robed in fire and uttering deep and terrible metaphysical truths was proof that they were unworthy servants. Servants of whom? Of what? Not of God, certainly God did not exist, I did not need to be told that, but of truth, of nothingness, of the void. To my youthful contemporaries, on the other hand, the brothers were simply boring. They were boring because everything was boring, and since everything was boring, nothing was boring. You just learned to live with it. Since I was in flight from religion, I assumed that my classmates had to be in flight from religion too, albeit in a quieter, savvier way than I had as yet been able to discover. Only today do I realize how mistaken I was. They were never in flight at all, nor are their children in flight or their grandchildren. By the time I reached my 70th year, I used to predict all the churches in the world would have been turned into barns or museums or potteries. But I was wrong. Behold, new churches spring up every day all over the place to say nothing of mosques. So Nietzsche's dictum needs to be amended. While it may be, while it may be that only the higher animals are capable of boredom, man proves himself highest of all by domesticating boredom, giving it a home. Thank you. Jennifer Rutherford, uh, can I begin by paying respects to the Ghana people um, and acknowledging their elders both past and present. John, this isn't the birthday that we'd planned for you, but then this has been a very bad year. Discussions about your 80th birthday began early in 2019. What were we going to do? How would we honour the occasion and what birthday could possibly follow traverses, the marvelous international fish shrift organized here in Adelaide by Brian Castro, then uh, director of the Kutsia Center to celebrate your 75th year. We were also, to be frank, a little bit nervous about your birthday. As successful as traverses had been, there were some unforgettable moments moments to throw you out of sleep at night. Hadn't we inadvertently smashed Dorothy's beloved garden pot and set fire to your kitchen? Hadn't there been a moment when a crowd of drunken bankers filled the gallery of your priceless manuscripts with balloons and bonbons and left their stiletto imprints on the plinth protecting a work by the celebrated artist Belinda de Brucker, de Brucker created for you. And then there was that moment at 5 a.m. in the morning when I went with the curator entrusted with the care of your manuscripts on loan from the Harry Ransom Center to collect them from a vault at the Hawke Prime Ministerial Library for their return flight to Texas and discovered that the taxi awaiting us on Hindley Street had been hijacked by a sex worker and then had a stand-up stoush for possession of the taxi, priceless literary manuscripts in hand. Now, we managed to keep much of that from you, John. <laughs> but nevertheless, I approached this birthday with a sense of trepidation. What could go wrong? In South Africa, Kai Easton and Herman Wittenberg were planning an exhibition, conference, and readings. Dorothy Driver had a secret book in progress, the Book of Friends, 
for which many of us in the JMCCP were writing chapters. But how should we mark your 80th birthday here in Adelaide? At first I thought to publish a new tome spanning the full gamut of your life and oeuvre. With Cambridge University Press on board, 40 chapters were planned, but problems arose and the plan faltered. Next, Anna Goldsworthy and I decided that this should be a day for Adelaideans celebrating your presence in our city. We would invite the public to a reading in the manner of Bloomsday, punctuating public readings with theatrical and musical performances commissioned in response to key Adelaidean moments in your works. How might a musical composition evoke that bicycle crash on McGill Road? Or better still, that moment in Manapara when Paul Raymond takes a spin on the magnificent gift of a recumbent bicycle. I found myself eyeing an ancient billy cart in an antique shop in the Adelaide Hills, wondering if with a new wheel and a, and a vivid red spray paint, it might serve us as a prop. But then we learnt that Nicholas Lenz had composed a new opera, Elizabeth Costello at the Gate, and that you had written the libretti, and that what would make you genuinely happy, you who didn't like birthdays, was its performance. And so late in the day, we embarked on an ambitious plan to stage a premier concert performance of the opera here in Adelaide. It was no small task and so many people worked to help achieve that. I'd like to take this moment to thank, um, in particular, Margaret and Oliver Mayo for their generous generosity and time working on that project, the Foundation of the Australian Liter Literary Studies Foundation, especially the work of Do uh, Dr. Thomas Bristow, Michael Haywood at Text, the JMCCP Committee, especially Anna Goldsworthy and Dr. Camille Houllier, and also to thank Abene Karakam um, for his endless financial advice as we attempted to garner the resources to create a concert performance of an opera at short notice. By February 2020, we were missing only a mezzo-soprano and a final act of generosity from our then VC. What could go wrong? <laughs> well, it was a very bad year. A year when artists and artworks, concerts and performances, artworks, art workers and art centres closed their doors across the globe. What we are left with at the end of 2020 were the doors of our own J.M. Kutzia Centre for Creative Practice closed these last eight months. And so many artists and writers out of work and their institutions damaged, uh, many of them irretrievably, is an enduring sense of how we need great art in our life. We here in Adelaide have been so fortunate to spend these years in dialogue with great art. The Kutzia Centre, established in honour of Jane Kutzia's presence amongst us, has enriched the cultural life of this city immeasurably, providing new meridians of dialogue and performance between local and international artists and writers, and between creative thinkers and their critical counterparts. John's generosity to the centre has been both symbolic and real, lending authority to our endeavours, drawing great artists into our fold, and building and enriching the lives and audiences for local artists. Thank you, John, for this very real contribution your presence has made to our cultural life. I doubt there is a person in this room who has not had an argument over dinner at a conference, at a friend's house, with their families, over that rape scene, or the relative merits of the earlier versus the later works, or the politics 
of Coetzee's style, or his self-fashioning, the self-fashioning of his authorship. How hotly contested these supposedly purely literary mat matters are. As the director of the Coetzee Center these last five years, I'm often privy to the intensity with which people live their relation to Coetzee's works. And it's an intensity that speaks to the in enduring authority of a great author. In the Diary of a Bad Year, the narrator of Strong Opinions writes of Tolstoy that during his later years, Tolstoy was treated not only as a great author, but as an authority on life, a, wa a wise man, a sage. His contemporary Walt Whitman endured a similar fate but neither had much wisdom to offer. Wisdom was not what they dealt in. They were poets above all. Otherwise, they were ordinary men with ordinary fallible opinions. The disciples who swarmed to them in quest of enlightenment looked sadly foolish in retrospect. What the great authors are masters of, the narrator continues, is authority. And he evokes Kierkegaard, learn to speak without authority. John, you're a master of speaking without authority. And yet we here in this room constantly evoke your authority, a paradox you draw our attention to in that passage. So let me end by drawing attention to the paradox of a birthday celebration for a man who seldom shares his opinions, perhaps except when it comes to birthdays. And wish you many future happy birthdays, and thank you for your enduring authority here amongst us. That's it. So thank you everyone, everyone for coming, um, all the participants. Um, and if you'd like to remain seated and watch the video, um, please do. Um, otherwise, if you will please exit by the east and western doors um, so that if you wish to attend the book signing, you can go round the front um, where there will be a line um, being mindful of COVID restrictions at all times. So, thank you. And, uh